So uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, AI technology is playing a bigger role than ever in the global economy and is transforming many fields, education among them. In this session, we'll provide an overview of the prominent research topics and research trends in AI for education. We have, we have gathered a panel of experts from academia and industry to talk about the biggest opportunities and difficulties in applying AI in education and how we can bridge core research and industry application. Uh, why don't we begin by having each of you introduce yourself. I'll, I'll call on each uh, of you one by one and you can give us a brief introduction. Ryan, do you want to start? Sure. I'm Ryan Baker. I'm at the University of Pennsylvania, where I direct the Penn Center for Learning Analytics. <clears throat> and I work uh, with various adaptive learning and online learning platforms to study engagement and learning and try to use that to uh, improve the environments I'm working with. Great. And Min Sam? Uh, hi, this is Min Sam. You can call me Sam. I'm a senior research scientist at Reed. Uh, I'm leading a group of researchers focusing on our core AI models put into production. Uh, while our group focuses on maintaining and improving uh, high quality education service uh, through the uh, AI model research, the entire research team uh, as a whole also puts emphasis on defining novel tasks and exploring new business opportunities. Before joining Reed, I used to work as a quant in an investment bank and a hedge fund in Hong Kong. And since financial industry focuses a lot on model reliability and interpretation, and that's exactly what I'm trying to bring in uh, AI industry. Terrific. Uh, Zach from UC Berkeley. Hey, greetings. Uh, I'm an associate professor in the Graduate School of Education uh, and an affiliate in Cognitive Science. Um, my work is focused on AI and adaptive learning, and in the last six years has been centered around recommender systems in education, primarily uh, higher education and bridges to higher education. Okay, and Phil? Hi, uh, I'm Phil Pavlik. Uh, I'm at the University of Memphis, uh, and I'm a cognitive psychologist in the Institute for Intelligent Systems in the Department of Psychology. Um, my research is focused on um, using computational models of cognition uh, to predict uh, performance, uh, and then using that performance, try to infer algorithms for optimal learning. Uh, so oftentimes it's a paradigm where you're student is seeing a, a number of practice items over a period of time. Okay. Uh, and Julian uh, in Montreal. Hi, everyone. I'm Julian Serban. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Corbett Technologies. We are a young startup developing an AI-powered learning platform to help democratize education. Um, the, the idea is to personalize the learning and make it active, as active as possible based on state-of-the-art machine learning techniques. Okay, uh, there's a lot to talk about. AI, of course, depends on data, uh, and, and data is what differentiates AI solutions from just rule-based adaptive learning. Uh, so we'll start there. I'll, I'll open this question to all of you. What kind of data are you each using in your research and how do you collect those, uh, that data? I guess uh, let's, let's go the same uh, order that we did before. Ryan, how do you collect the data that you're using in your research? So I use a variety of types of data. Um, I use data on the interaction between learners and learning technologies. I use uh, data from uh, classroom researchers um, who can be um, labeling like student emotion for training data. I use student real-time self-report and also uh, long-term longitudinal outcomes of various sorts, whether it be high school to college transition or first job after college. Min Sam or Sam, what about uh, Reed? I know Reed has, uh, has collected this massive public data set. Uh, can you talk about the data that you guys are using? 
Sure. Uh, at Read, we basically try to take the full leverage of the user experience from mobile and web application platforms uh, formatted in non-personal identifiable matter. Um, we can't say that uh, every single bit of those information is critical, but we try our best to collect as much information as possible uh, in order to keep all research directions open. And such user interaction data ranges from uh, learning content consumption and question solving and general application use, uh, usage behavior. We even considered uh, collecting accelerometer and gyroscope sensors from mobile app mm -hmm. users. That's interesting. Uh, Zach, what about you? Uh, most of the data I'm looking at these days in higher education are uh, institutional data. So for example, we look at um, 10 years of historic enrollment data from UC Berkeley. Mm -hmm. um, the most recent data set has been joined with demographics like uh, race, gender, uh, unrepresented um, uh, first gen status, uh, and so forth. Um, and we've been working with um, various systems of higher education to uh, expand and generalize analyses to their data sets. So for example, um, the uh, City University of New York system has around 18 institutions and we have a collaboration with them to um, ask some of these research questions to a, a broader higher ed data set. Um, and and uh, all of that data is is that qualitative data or is that uh, digitized? It's digitized. Um, you know, student uh, anonymized student ID, semester grade they got in the class. Um, th there is some natural language data that we scrape, like um, kind of rate my professor type of sites. Not that site in particular, but um, collecting uh, information about. Uh, course evaluations to kind of augment the sources of semantic information uh, about courses. And Phil? So my data collection, I think, is, is best described as um, trying to get uh, a very broad-based understanding of all of the factors involved in the learning of the student in whatever application I'm studying. Uh, but there's a lot of generality I see in the models I use. Uh, and so, uh, you know, in the past, that's included, you know, kind of traditional me measures like when people have done ex exercises, whether they got them right or wrong, how long they took. Um, more recently, uh, we're also going to be integrating and we are integrating, uh, you know, uh, sort of motivational measures uh, and, and measures such as, you know, their reading ability uh, into that quantitative model. Uh, again, we're looking for factors uh, in the student data that are going to be uh, manipulable, uh, easy to manipulate, uh, so as to be able to, you know, uh, uh, control the, 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 the learning of the student and optimize that learning. And Julian. Yeah, I think the data that we look at, Corbett, is similar to um, what Sam was, was talking about earlier. We're, we track the students on the Corbett learning platform. We track their interactions, um, similar to what Phil talked about. Like students on our platform do a variety of activities from exercises, projects, uh, to watching videos and reading material. And we track all of that. We track how they react, what they respond, the time in between when they log out, when they log in. Um, and then we, we try to you know, identify points here that are actionable that allow the models to, to take some actions and then you, we feed that into machine learning models. That yeah, uh, I mean, one of the things that interests me is uh, whether we have enough quality data sets to do the research that needs to be done in AI for education and whether there are benchmarks that allow different research projects to measure their success against uh, Ryan, in your view, are there enough data sets in the field of education compared with other sectors? I don't know that there's ever possible to have enough data sets. Um, there's a lot of good data sets, but I feel like the data sets that are largely available are restricted to a certain set of types of environments. And there's not as much availability, for example, there's a lot of availability in math 
and in science. There's a lot of availability in intelligent tutors and uh, homework style platforms. There's a lot less uh, public data out there still in things like simulations or games or some other domains. So I think we've got some great data out there, but we could do better still. Yeah, and, and is there a way that we could be collecting more data? I mean, one thing that strikes me is, is the world uh, of education remains one of uh, pencils and paper and uh, chalk and, and slate, or I guess uh, uh, ink pens and, and whiteboards uh, that, that don't collect data. Is is uh, is this something that uh, that is going to improve? I would guess is uh, the world of education employs more uh, electronics. Yeah, certainly. Um, I just at uh, my institution, uh, our uh, learning management system, we use Canvas. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the institutional entities are starting to open up those data in anonymized form to do research on. We see this in the whole field of learning analytics. Um, uh, and, you know, certainly during the pandemic, it was much more digital usage. And I think a lot of that's going to stick around, right, past uh, remote only instruction. Um, whether or not some of the big players like, you know, Google Classroom ever opens up uh, data for research purposes is up to them. But, um, you know, Zoom, for example, all of the chat logs are now digitized, digitized mm -hmm. right? And I know institutions are starting to go negotiate with Zoom saying, can we have those data of our institution's chat logs and so forth? So I think it, it will um, keep increasing the amount that we're able to collect. But I, I also want to put out there that um, uh, more data is always good um, uh, for this kind of research, but we also need to expand our ability to collect experimental data. Right, because uh, essentially, um, at the end, you want to affect learning, and you can come up with hypotheses, but you need to do a lot of experimentation. So, uh, platforms like Neil Heffernan's assessments, uh, he invites researchers to run experiments on his platform. You know, within uh, reasonable instructional bounds, uh, I, I run live, you know, in vivo experiments uh, with students at the university on course recommender systems, for example, to measure things like how surprising or unexpected was a course recommendation. It's really hard to gauge that in offline analysis. It's kind of a human factor that you need to collect those kinds of um, live data. So a combination of offline and live data collection will be important for education. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting what you said about Google Classroom. Uh, and you're right, a lot of, uh, because of the shift to online, there's been a, a tremendous amount of data collected over the past year, year and a half. But much of that data is held by uh, private companies. Uh, is there a movement to open that up to the research community and, and pool data sets? I guess, Ryan, do you know the answer to that? I mean, uh, our colleague here um, has released data. Um, other companies have released data. Um, Cognitive Tutor, um, Assessments, there have been a few platforms. I think that the number of platforms that are releasing data is much smaller than the number that are not. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that, including kind of some incentive structure things, concerns about being criticized for violating privacy. The, the, the providers who have uh, released data have been able to do it pretty safely and without any adverse effects. But I think there's always a kind of conservatism and concern. But Sam, uh, do you wanna say more because you've released some data. And we are preparing to launch a service called Read Classroom. We do know that we are trying to collect uh, as much data as possible from either Google or Zoom uh, in order to make a, 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 do additional research in formative assessment and expanding our domain across uh, beyond uh, testing frameworks. Yeah, um, yeah, and certainly uh, Reed is is uh, released uh, the EdNet data set that's uh, uh, that that you've collected out of uh, your uh, test prep apps uh, and made that public. 
and, and frankly, from a layman's point of view, uh, it does all education data seems to me that would be relatively low risk. It's not like uh, health data or medical uh, records. What what is the concern? I mean, there's always going to be somebody who can demonstrate that they can uh, de-anonymize data in education. But uh, is there a real concern uh, about the the privacy of students? Zach, I'll ask you that. Sure. Since you, yeah. I I think there's something private about the learning process, right? Just like there's something private about a relationship you have with someone. There's something private about, um, uh, you know, the the cognitive development process. So if if you're uh, at the beginnings of learning a new skill, there's a, a myriad of misconceptions or partial understandings that you have, and mm -hmm. in that moment, you may not want a photo to be taken of you and put out there for advertisers or put out there for future employers as part of whatever this you know conglomerate of information that's being collected about us and decisions being made by AI, AI outside of education, you may not want that to be part of your public profile. Um, and, uh, you know, learning being an affective process as well, you also want learners pedagogically to feel safe, right, to feel supported, that it's okay to make mistakes, you know, in this region of learning. And with that means, you know, there's not going to be these gotchas, of, you know, mm -hmm. oh, hey, look, you got a really slow start in this MOOC course. We're not sure we want to hire you at Google. Um, I think that's a concern and it's a valid one. Yeah. Uh, Sam, you, you, as I mentioned, Reed publicly released a massive uh, educational data set. What was the, the logic behind that? Mm, okay. As opposed to other AI fields like uh, computer vision or natural language processing, AI ed didn't really have a single data set that could be used to properly train a deep neural network and uh, leverage recent technological breakthroughs from deep learning. Most existing data sets were of a relatively small size where traditional statistical models performed pretty much on, on par with deep neural networks. And fortunately, Reed had a large enough user base that generated billions of interaction records, atomic re interaction records, and research capability to verify whether deep learning indeed provides any edge. Uh, by publicly releasing the data to uh, academia and launching Kaggle competition on top of it, we wanted to raise uh, some sort of interest, academic interest in adopting deep learning based models uh, in the AI community. And the competition was pretty successful by becoming the most popular competition in 2020 uh, among all Kaggle competitions. And all top entries were based on deep neural networks. And because of that, we believe that, uh, we believe releasing the data set was uh, one of our best business decisions last year. And uh, we hope it made a meaningful contribution to the community as well. In, in both uh, Reed and, and Corbett's uh, cases, uh, you've shown the uh, improvement in student outcomes. Uh, it, it, I'd like to hear from the uh, from from Zach and Phil and Ryan. Uh, how do you view those outcomes in systems like uh, Reed and Corbett's? Uh, are are they anomalies? Are they are you satisfied that? that the state of the art is enough to improve outcomes? Um, or, or do you think uh, that, uh, that uh, they're showing something else and that more research needs to be done? Uh, yeah, and, and uh, in terms of deep learning, I can't remember which one. I think, Zach, uh, you said that you're not using deep learning and you weren't using deep learning in, in one of the references you've made uh, is is the promise of deep learning in this regard overstated? Do you think? I think that might have been Phil. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it sounds like I sounds like I could have said that. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, I've used both um, uh, back in um, uh, and and continue to use both. So um, the the non deep uh, knowledge tracing has. Um, actually 
there's several options for the non-deep knowledge tracing, but a popular one has been Bayesian knowledge tracing. Um, and whenever someone consults me on, you know, uh, how to make Bayesian knowledge tracing work for their domain, my lab has put out a, a Python library um, for Bayesian knowledge tracing called PyBKT, and you pip install PyBKT. Um, uh, and they ask me, you know, how do we use this in our game or how do we use it in this or that scenario? And really it's the, the, the power of Bayesian knowledge tracing is really thinking about yourself, what students are learning in the domain, right? Doing that cognitive task analysis, figuring out what is the, what is the learning objective, right? What is the purpose of the design of this environment? And so it's kind of a, um, the, the machine learning aspect, I think, of BKT is often a little bit overplayed. It, it's really the strength of the skill model that makes it work. Uh, and then it fills in some of the gaps of, of forecasting and learning curve um, creation. Um, what's, and then I've also used uh, deep models. So, for example, when uh, we want to just do pure prediction and not have an interpretation, so in a course recommendation system, uh, we may want to predict what are the likely courses a student will take next. In, in part, that's a signal of what we could recommend, but it's likely to be stuff that the student already knows about because they're likely to enroll in it. So it could be kind of a, a signal of what's going to be the most expected recommendations. But in any case, the short answer is I've found deep learning to be very useful for predicting behaviors. Where are people going to click? What are they going to click on next? What are they going to enroll in next? Um, whereas non-deep models, um, seem more useful, like Ryan said, we're, we're trying to figure out how the deep models can be used for some of the more classical tasks, classical tasks like knowledge tracing, what do students know, um, uh, and, and things where you're going to want an interpretation. But behavior prediction, deep models are uh, extremely valuable, in particular because it's a, um, often an underdefined domain, right? We don't have a bunch of hypotheses and feature engineering to do for behavior and deep, deep uh, models can create that semantic space and, and do embedding and leverage all those data. Yeah, um, I have a, a couple of questions that I'd, I'd written out before, uh, to, to, so I'd, I'd like to get to some of them. And on that uh, point of, uh, of predicting behavior, uh, and I'll ask Ryan, increasing student engagement is perhaps the most difficult problem facing teachers, let alone uh, AI systems. Uh, can you talk about the models you've developed to detect engagement and how do you think AI learning systems could help increase engagement? Sure, so people like engagement modeling has been around now for about over 15 years since our first model of it back in 04. Um, and we can now model like in a range of different kinds of learning environments. Um, mm -hmm simulations, games, intelligent tutors, homework platforms, we can model a, a range of types of behavioral disengagement and emotional engagement and disengagement. And our models are actually pretty mature in that. But surprisingly, the, the systems that try to use those to adapt and to improve engagement, it's still kind of in the realm of one-off uh, research projects. Um, and there's been a few of them, uh, Arroyo's work, with Math Spring, uh, DeFalco's work with TC3 Sim, DeMello's work uh, with AutoTutor. But, but I think that actually, and I'm going to kind of pair it, uh, fill here a little bit. Um, the, the act of trying to figure out how to take a student who we know is disengaged and re engage them in a specific context and environment, especially given the individual differences between students, is much more right now of an art than an engineering practice. We're gonna need a lot more successful examples before. And, um, and I think that also like approaches where you build out a lot of different designs and you try them and you use things like reinforcement learning to figure out what works for who, we need a lot of that. And um, it's surprising to me how much progress we've made at detecting and how little progress we've made at intervening in that area. Yeah. Uh, Phil, can you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, uh, MOFAX, the mobile fact and concept training system that you've worked on, how does it help students uh, better understand and remember course content? Sure. Uh, um, well, right now I'm working on an IES grant from the Department of Education where we're looking at anatomy and physiology. Uh, but the whole idea of MOFAX goes back to what I originally called the fact system, 
uh, <clears throat> which was kind of a, a way to do that bridging between academia uh, and actual applications in the classroom uh, for, by providing a, a kind of a software platform where you could uh, specify, you know, generic content, whether it's anatomy and physiology or math facts or foreign language vocabulary, relatively simple content, I, I will agree. Uh, however, important content nonetheless, uh, specify that content uh, and then uh, uh, gather data about that content to describe a computational model uh, and then use that computational model uh, by kind of uh, completing the cycle uh, in uh, an adaptive algorithm uh, in so a classroom experiment. Uh, and so it, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, got, got that sort of uh, laboratory uh, to uh, industry sort of uh, goal to it. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, uh, right now it's, it's uh, we're, we're doing a lot of, uh, you know, interesting testing, like I say, improving the model to add these sort of motivational factors and, and factors having to do with uh, uh, the things like reading, which is really important uh, for anatomy and physiology, uh, especially since we're in a community college uh, a, a, a sample right now. Uh, and so there are uh, quite a few students who have issues with reading. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the idea uh, and how that MOFAX project has been going. And, and what are the algorithms or family of algorithms that MOFAX depends on? Does, is, does it include any of the... Great question. Yeah. Uh, so um, so I, I use what I call now logistic knowledge tracing. Uh, mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know, originally it was the performance factors analysis. And before that, it was the additive factors mat model. And of course, ad the additive factors model is kind of related to item response theory. Uh, and, and so it's one of these models, it's predicting the probability. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> I, I take it quite a, uh, quite a step beyond that, because it's not just predicting the probability, but it's how I use that. So my original, my undergraduate work was in microeconomics. Uh, and, and the idea behind um, the algorithm in MOFAX is what you want to do is for each item, you want to compute the efficiency for that item, uh, which is a, a, a function of the gain uh, if you practice that item now uh, as compared to the time cost, the likely time cost if you practice that item now, including the possible cost if you get it wrong for having to do additional review. Uh, and so you have this sort of gain divided by cost function, this efficiency function. Uh, and so, so that was the original uh, dissertation research actually uh, that motivated the whole project and you know, carries through you know, more than 15 years later now. Uh, it is this uh, applying economic principles to a computational model of, of human cognition. Mm. Uh, Julian, can you talk about the models or algorithms, algorithms that you use with uh, in Corbett, uh, and and do the 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 strategies that Phil's talking about uh, resonate? I mean, are we one of the things I have uh, I'm having a trouble understanding is how much of an overlap uh, is there in in the research applications between uh, the different people here, or whether you're each toiling away in a very uh, separate island? <laughs> um, that's a good question. I, I think there's one difference, again, I, I'm, I'm back to the same point as before, but one difference I think is that in Phil's algorithm, he has a clear signal if the student solves an item or not. It's sort of a binary signal. Um, I, I believe it's the same case in the framework that Zach mentioned earlier, the spatial uh, knowledge tracing library, you, you need to have that in order to update your parameter estimates over time. But in our case, we don't have that. We have sort of student answers or essay answers or code solutions that might or might not be correct. And so we have to operate in sort of a very, like it's, it's a even more probabilistic framework where we have to make some assumptions like, oh, there's this probability that the student that solved this exercise. And based on these probabilities, we then make an inference about their learning state or their knowledge state. Um, but, but I mean, ultimately we solve similar, there are some you know, very similar problems. One of the big things we do is um, a, a type of reinforcement learning where we try to 
select the right type of feedback for a student. So let's say a student is doing an exercise, um, they get it wrong. Like we again, probabilistically, we can't be sure until we've had you know a set of teachers review it. Even one teacher is not enough actually to to get a good estimate. But uh, but in practice, we come we have some probability the student might have done a mistake or their answer is insufficient in an exercise. And so there is sort of a, a reinforcement learning system or a recommender system that's been trained to select the optimal feedback, which can be a hint, uh, a prompt, an example, a, a, a definition, maybe uh, you know a reformulation of the student's answer and so on. And so we're using these kinds of algorithms, we, which in our case, it's are not Bayesian, but they do include many features about the student, and, and many of them are interpretable. So we understand, oh, this feature is being triggered for this type of answer, and we can see, oh, that makes sense when we look at it. And other features cannot be interpreted, but they are still relevant. They are correlated, so we let the model chew on them and, and make a better prediction if it can. Um, so, so we use a variety of algorithms, a mix of supervised regression type algorithm to predict performance of students and recommender systems uh, based on some relatively simple reinforcement learning algorithms to select the optimal interventions. Uh, how, um, how, go ahead. Was someone going to say something there? Oh, I just wanted to add, we published five papers in the last year, um, and we detailed some of these algorithms in a lot of in a lot of detail. So you can, you can, if anyone is interested, they can go to, uh, to our profile, the, the corporate website, and they can look it up. Most of them are also on archive for free. Uh, and Sam, how much of an overlap is there between the work at Reed and the work at Corbett? Because they're trying to do similar things, even if the, the data they're working on is different or the, uh, the, 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 just the responses from the students are different. Mm -hmm. uh, so based on what I heard from uh, from Julian, uh, I think we are on similar track, but I think we are focusing more on atomic or fundamental tasks of knowledge tracing or score prediction. And we are using those uh, models as an oracle to feed into the recommender system. and. I think uh, in our company, the models that do uh, those more fundamental tasks of knowledge tracing or score prediction uh, has, uh, their maturity is much better or larger than uh, that of recommender system. And we, in terms of algorithms, I think we are, we would probably be using very similar class of algorithms. So we combine uh, classical algorithms uh, along with the more modern algorithms and take a look at whether they are in sync or not. And if they are not, then we try to uh, mitigate uh, the issue by taking a look at more interpretable models and anchoring those deep learning models based on those uh, more interpretable models. And I think one of our uh, best advantages is that we have large user base and we can do a lot of live parallel testing of different algorithms. Uh, we just, uh, a few minutes ago, we discussed about uh, user engagement and the difference between knowledge tracing and representation of actual student knowledge state. Uh, we might not be answering the hidden the, the hidden layer or the gap between those concepts, but when we conducted live testing of different algorithms, uh, the discrepancy between uh, models in terms of those quantified metrics, for example, classification accuracy or uh, area under ROC, they did make difference in user uh, user response. For example, if the quantified metric is a bit higher in algorithm B over A, then the service uh, related, the service generated metrics, for example, a user retention rate or user usage hour was higher, was meaningfully higher than, than the other algorithm. Um, 
Okay, uh, 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 Zach, you use uh, behavioral and semantic data to map paths to cognitive and career achievement. I actually copied that from one of your sites. Uh, can you uh, tell us how uh, what what algorithms uh, or or models you're using and how you envision that work being applied in real life? Sure. Uh... So the general suite of models that that's currently describing is essentially um, virtual advising, right? Um, in higher education, um, two million or so uh, students join higher education in the United States at two-year uh, public institutions, community colleges. 81% um, want to transfer to a four-year, but after six years, only 13 have. And mm -hmm. so the... Um, it, advising, more advising could be part of a socio-technical solution. And there have been initiatives to try to pay more advisors, um, but that's you know eventually going to run out of money. So the effort of what is called the Ask Oski project has been to see where can we use machine learning and kind of human-centered studies, um, sometimes called human-centered AI, um, uh, in order to augment advising and help students to their degree and eventually career goals. Um, we haven't yet gotten to the career part, but um, we're, we're getting there. So um, at a liberal arts university where you have a degree of a high degree of freedom and elective choice, there's a different set of algorithms that might in different considerations than if you're in a program that had very low elective choice. So when it's high elective choice, it, it really is a recommender system as opposed to just saying, do this, right? you get to choose how you want to satisfy you know, um, your American histories requirement, which is something at, at UC Berkeley. Um, and so it, acknowledging that students have choice, and especially when you're at the age of higher education, you want to also kind of nurture a sense of agency. And so mm -hmm. one of the features of, of a real deployed system at the institution that um, uh, my lab Whoops, I, I've lost uh, Zach. I don't know if anyone else has. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the word to VEC model is being trained over course enrollment histories instead of course catalog descriptions or something like that. And so we get different sources of semantics about courses. And then we allow students to say, okay, I really liked this course. What courses across the institution have something in common with this course? And there really isn't an expert on campus who could answer that. But the machine learning model has kind of culled together multimodal sources of semantics, can answer that. And then really quickly, another use case is not exploration, but I want to get out of here, right? I want to satisfy my requirements and get out on time. How can I do that? Um, and for that, we use a combination of rules that we get from the university for degree um, attainment, so from the degree audit system, and we combine that with a, um, a natural language model, a BERT model, which is a transformer based, it's, it's among the state of the art models for mm -hmm. sequence prediction. Um, but again, instead of applying the NLP model to natural language, we apply it to sequences of course enrollment, so that students can kind of get a trajectory of multi semester predictions ahead, what maybe should you take two semesters from now, three semesters, four semesters, and then allow them to kind of personalize by saying, I like that, I don't like that, and then it changes that forecast. And that's that's a behavior prediction model. And so deep nips have been very effective for that. Hmm. That's, that's interesting. Does any of that in your mind have application uh, in, in education and in, in uh, delivering optimal content to students uh, on a learning path? Uh, and because there are elements of it that are are similar. Where I see the most immediate um, potential benefit, let's say in, in K-12, like the systems that uh, Sam Julian are, are working on, is um, machine learned models that can infer the equivalence of two different educational elements, right? Mm -hmm. We use this to say what courses are similar to one another. We can also do that across different institutions, right? saying this uh, calculus course is academically equivalent to the calculus course over there, but not academically equivalent to a calculus course over there. So how does that help? Well, when you have these equivalencies, you can now make it easier for students to kind of get credit or be mobile with their credit 
pick up something from a MOOC provider, pick up something from Reed, take some courses at their brick and mortar, and then using machine learning, we can kind of have a universal model of how equivalent are all of these things instead of having this really expensive manual human process of articulation that costs millions and millions of dollars and has to be updated you know, every five years, that's not trackable. Yeah, uh, I, we started off talking about knowledge tracing um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, testing, uh, uh, summative, uh, models as opposed to formative models, I guess is the language that's being used. Uh, if you know, uh, if you can track a student's knowledge state over time, it, is it possible to use that uh, instead of uh, sort of snapshot tests that, that carry so much uh, judgment and and uh, sort of force students into uh, a very unproductive cycle of cramming and uh, and then relaxation or zoning out uh, is is that something that that you guys have thought about um, I, maybe I'll start with Ryan you know a lot of colleges are moving away from the SAT and ACT uh, and other interest exams. Are there any formative assessment systems uh, that you've seen being adopted by edu educational institutions? Um, so systems like NWEA MAP are already used to try to predict those tests and to try to change results. What I'm personally particularly excited about is the potential of adaptive learning platforms where um, it's all where students are using it across the whole year to learn, and it's also measuring them. And uh, research on both assessments and cognitive tutor have shown that those systems are really, really accurate at predicting standardized tests. I I haven't seen the results for Reed, but I suspect the same would be very true there if it hasn't. Perhaps it's already been documented. So to my mind, you know, it's so easy to like get stressed out and have a bad day or not feel well and get a bad measurement and there's an entire problem with cheating teachers that you can't have if you have like data from the entire year. Um, I just think there's so many advantages to moving, moving standardized exams to being something that's rare and used for auditing purposes um, and for validation purposes, as opposed to something we do to every single kid. So I, I, I feel like the technology is there. It's just a matter of the political will. Yeah, and and on the political will, do you see that shifting uh, with with COVID and and the uh, that you know having a break from standardized testing simply because you can't gather people in in one place? A lot of states right. did standardized yeah. testing even with, even even with COVID, even with a lot of states still did standardized testing. I, I don't know. It's it's kind of outside of my area of expertise. What do other folks think? Well, so I'm thinking of the issue of standardization, which is sort of what you would need to be able to use these uh, uh, formative tests for the same purpose uh, in order to uh, rate and compare students. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, it doesn't seem like, you know, if one system, one student is using RID or one student is using Cognitive Tutor, how you could compare those two students any longer, unless you had some sort of perfect comparison of RID and, and cognitive tutors work at the same time. And so I think there's a lot of practicalities. I agree with Ryan that the potential is there, but it, you'd have to have some major company distributing a standardized learning application, which would then be able to be substituted for that standardized test, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good point. Uh, that's one I hadn't uh, thought of, frankly. Uh, one alternative to that, if I can interject. Yeah. Of of a uh, uh, standardization. So, you could say we have that same problem when it comes to language, right? Not everyone in the world speaks the same language. Uh, so, one approach to that could be, well, let's all agree on a universal language. The other is to have good translation, right? What does mm -hmm. this skill in system A mean in terms of this skill in system B? And I think machine learning is very good at that. 
Um, our lab's done some work on, on translating skill taxonomies across platforms. It, it's just at the beginning of the inception of that work, but um, I think that's a, a promising way to get around this intractable task of let's all agree on you know, a unified taxonomy. And Zach, you've worked with K through 12 educators and students to integrate educational technology uh, as a formative assessment tool. Can you tell us what technologies you've, you've worked with? Yeah, that was uh, with um, uh, uh, a researcher who I referenced before, Neil Heffernan, uh, on the assistance mm. project. Um, and, and germane to your question of, should we do more summative or formative testing the word assistments is a combination of assisting and assessment, right? So it is trying to strike a balance uh, uh, between um, teaching, learning, while at the same time assessing. And assessments was one of the first platforms that did the correlation to show that um, there's very high accuracy in predicting the end of year standardized tests based on activity while learning. But I will say I'm sympathetic to um, the tension between formative and summative assessment you, know, you have a whole psychometric and measurement community with the testing and providers, and their one goal or their main goal is to measure something stationary at a given time, right? So at this moment in time, what do you know? Mm -hmm. um, whereas tutoring systems or the learning sciences community, the AI and education community wants students' knowledge to be changing, right? So it's harder to measure something that's changing. And so there is a tension there. And I don't think you can get as accurate of measurement when things are changing as you can when things are stationary. But um, 20 to 25 hours of standardized testing on average per year for students in American public schools per year. So wow. uh, I think the will is quickly coming to transition to more formative approaches. Yeah. And, and Phil, what, uh... Zach mentioned this translation between systems and deep learning, uh, being able to possibly do that. What do, what do you think of that as a solution to the standardization issue? Well, I mean, it's not impossible for sure, uh, but it does sound like it would require a lot of work and it still would have some sort of limitation because you would only be able to do it with the most important uh, software out there. You couldn't do it with, you know, John down the street software, uh, you, you would uh, need to have some sort of standard, uh, but uh, it's possible that you could do something like that. That makes sense to me. Yeah. Uh, Sam, what kind of research efforts is Reed doing here? And uh, I know there's been a lot of talk of, about uh, uh, formative assessment at Reed. We are treating content recommendation for assessment and for optimized learning as a separate tracks. So in the user's life cycle, they are continuously being assessed while they're uh, consuming the learning content uh, simultaneously. So we keep continuously changing knowledge state of all the users. And based on that, we recommend the best content to either best assess the user state and also uh, optimize the user's learning path. So as a life cycle, this, we do involve formative assessment. Yeah, uh, I, I actually heard from somebody at, at Reed a comment that I thought was pretty interesting that a lot of parents are resistant uh, about shifting to formative assessment because they want that score because mm -hmm. society is built around these, uh, these scores or grades. Uh, as, as a validation for their, their career advancement. Uh, Julian, does that, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add a comment because Sam said something very interesting there. Like you know, the REIT's adaptive system isn't trying uh, necessarily to get the best assessment. It's trying to get the student to the highest level, right? It's optimizing their path. And Mm -hmm. For Corbett, it's the same. Like you, we're assessing students to the extent that we can help them. Uh, like the, the models are learning how to pick the next item or how to pick the next uh, feedback so that they can maximize the learning outcome of the student. But if there isn't an item, let's say the reason the student is struggling here is because they forgot you know, some concept 
but it's not in the system, it won't learn to model that because there is no incentive for the system. It, even if it could model that, you know, misconception or missing concept, it doesn't matter. The, the recommender system or the reinforcement learning agent will not have any reward from having learned that. So I think there is a tension there that we haven't discussed, like adaptive learning systems. Are they maximizing student learning outcomes or are they maximizing the accuracy of assessing the student's level? Those are mm. two different things. Um, yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, the um, the it, 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 one of the I mean, I mean, Julian, you're pretty close to the market as as is Sam. Uh, one of the challenges in deploying these uh, systems uh, is that uh, that that you're you're taking on a certain responsibility. Uh, for uh, for the people that are engaging with them, I mean, they're trusting that the system is is uh, doing the right thing. Uh, what are the challenges, Julian, in deploying uh, AI-enabled education educational applications? And is is uh, what's the research being done to address those challenges? That wasn't the clearest <laughs> question in the world. <laughs> no, it's a it's a very big question because there are many many challenges there, and um, I, I, I don't want to hawk the conversation, but like one one point you said was about trust, right? Do you want the learners, the students on the platform, to trust the system to be effective, to be helping them? Uh, and, and one thing we run into as we have open-ended answers from students or they do coding projects is, of course, the system will make mistakes. Sometimes students, they will give a, a correct answer to a question, um, but it's just something the system has never seen before. And so it might reject that student. Um, I, I think maybe, maybe um, Phil was talking about intelligent tutoring system. Maybe he experienced the same in some of his uh, research projects. So it's hard to build trust and that's why some systems uh, fall back on multiple choice quizzes because then you've solved part of that trust, but you've also limited yourself immensely in the output space. And also you are limiting to some extent the students, you know, potential for learning. So I think that's one of the, one, that's one of the limits that uh, one of the challenges that you have to face here. The other thing I guess is also about very closely related, it's around explainability. Does the student understand why they're getting this feedback? Do they understand why they get the score? And then we're back to that discussion that, you know, uh, deep learning models can maybe have a higher performance, but they're more difficult to interpret, they're more volatile. How do we do that in practice? Like Sam was talking about this earlier. In practice, sometimes if the two models disagree, the deep learning model and the traditional model, then you have to take some actions because, you can't just show the deep learning's prediction because it will be confusing to the student. It will shatter that trust that's there. Yeah. Uh, Ryan, we were talking earlier, we mentioned benchmarks. Are there adequate benchmarks to show that AI models in education are reliable? And, and I'm presuming the answer is no. So how, how can we develop those benchmarks? Uh, I mean, part of the problem is that reliable you know, we, we had the comparison from, I think, Julian a minute ago about um, psychometric, you know, and t testing versus there's been, you know, there was so much work over decades to figure out what reliable and valid meant in psychometrics. And we're still figuring that out. And I would give the example of algorithmic bias, right? Mm -hmm. Like um, we, a uh, recent review uh, that I did with Aaron Hahn, we reviewed all the literature on algorithmic bias in education, and there's very little of it. We don't even really have a good idea of what groups we have to be validating that our algorithms work for, uh, much less have demonstrated it. You know, we're still figuring out what the metrics are. So there's so many dimensions of determining that an artificially intelligent model is valid or that a system's behavior is appropriate. And, you know, we're at the very beginning of that process. We're figuring out even this year, kind of things that now we're like, oh my gosh, how did we not know that? How did we not think about that? Yeah, I'd build on that, um, it, you know, there's been some uh, high publicity results in AI, for example, with facial recognition, where, mm -hmm. you know, uh, groups 
that are not very represented in the data set in, ter in terms of skin, skin color have very low classification accuracy, right? And it's as would be expected. Um, um, uh, if you don't have very many of a particular label, it's not going to be um, predicted well. But when you take that idea and you apply it to education, um, it really asks, who are we serving well with our AI algorithms? And often, AI and education, one of the main um, beneficiaries, we hope, are students who are a little bit behind, right? Mm -hmm. We want to lift them up. But if the students who are behind are in the minority in terms of their behaviors, and let's say you have a grade prediction algorithm, we did some of this bias analysis in predicting grades in higher education, and let's say they produce Cs and that on average, but that the majority grade is a B or an A, then that group is going to be less accurately predicted. So in effect, your AI algorithm is least accurate on the students who you want to support the most. And so, you know, what kind of strategies um, can we uh, adopt from general fairness conversations and AI and so forth? That, that's going to be an important metric going forward, fairness, validity, um, and reliability. Uh, Phil, in, in your view, uh, how can AI, how can we use AI to improve education and, and what is the area that needs to be explored most? Uh, gosh, another large question. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, on some level, I, you know, I think that uh, these equity questions are going to become increasingly important um, because, uh, you know, the, the students uh, who can afford good teachers uh, are probably not going to be the first ones to use what we build. Uh, because what we build might not be equivalent to a, you know, a very skilled master teacher who can demand a, a good salary at a private school, uh, uh, you know, right away. Uh, and so uh, I think we have to be careful that, you know, uh, we're not kind of uh, being used to turn education into sort of a factory situation. Uh, and that uh, we're addressing the issues like Zach was just pointing out, uh, uh, you know, head on, uh, because uh, uh, I, I really don't want to, uh, you know, have my research uh, be part of what is essentially a second class educational system where we put the uh, disadvantaged children in front of computers uh, and uh, all of the wealthier children have tutors. Mm -hmm. Human tutors. Yeah, well, that's interesting. Although I would argue that the promise of AI for education is, uh, I mean, there's always going to be that that inequality, but th there are there are not enough teachers uh, to to teach all the children uh, in the world, and there. Are, uh, I, I I disagree with that statement. I think that there isn't the political will to pay. Uh, uh, the education colleges and, and to pay teachers. Uh, and, and I think that, uh, you know, uh, people prefer to have lower taxes, generally speaking, than they do having a very strong educational system in many countries. Yeah, yeah. In the United States, I'm, I, I'm talking more globally that, that there are countries where, where there just aren't um, an, uh, the, the, when I, you're right, that's a political question as well. In, in countries that have the resources, but uh, but nonetheless, this this could be a baseline. Uh, AI systems, tutoring systems, could provide a baseline uh, for students who otherwise are in uh, locations that don't have the tax base or the political will to provide them. Uh, and and you know maybe it wouldn't reach every student, but but there's always going to be a, a, a percentage of, of students in any population that are self-motivated if given the re resources. So to, to me, that's, uh, that's uh, what's exciting about it. And, and also uh, the, that AI, an AI system could, could act as the teacher's aid. It doesn't have to re replace the teacher, but it can, uh, do a lot of the 
the the work uh, on a on a more personalized level uh, that a teacher doesn't have time for. We, I, I, just summing up, uh, can we go around the the virtual room? How far do you think uh, do each of you think we are from having a system that that can do those things that we would all like? an AI system to do in education, it, 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 you know, provide that baseline uh, education for, uh, for students that aren't getting uh, qualified or quality teaching. Uh, I don't know, to, uh, Ryan, do you want to start? Um, it's, it's all a continuum, right? We already have systems yeah. today that are taking good teachers and making them better and that are supporting teachers that maybe wouldn't do as well and giving them good results. We already have systems today where um, in such settings like, um, for example, like the United Arab Emirates where teacher attention is such a huge problem and, and they're paying their teachers well, it's just a matter of the population being largely transient. And so they have a lot of teacher turnover. They've shown that they can take master teachers, pay them better, and give them uh, AI-based systems and they can have classes of 60 and get just as good outcomes as mm. much smaller classes. So I think we've got a lot of that today. We're just gonna keep getting better and uh, pushing in that direction. Um, there's not gonna be one magic cutoff point where it, where it works. We're just gonna kind of slowly get a little bit better at uh, educating kids, I think. Yeah, well, man, let me put it this way on a, on a, on a curve from zero to, uh, to uh, perfect. Uh, where do you think we are on that curve? Um, I would say that, um, let me give two numbers. One is the number of what our best tech is. I think our best tech is maybe a third of the way to where we can get. And then mm -hmm. what's the, where's the tech that the average kid is getting? And it's way below that. Yeah. Because right now the market still doesn't know the difference between amazingly rich, powerful AI-based systems and something where the adaptive algorithm is something they came up with on a whiteboard in an hour and a half. It's yeah. Just not able to tell the difference really. Sam, what do you, what do you think about that? Where, where on the curve are we and uh, how long do you, do you think it will be before we have a system that's really gonna transform education? Uh, working in industry, I think uh, I'm, I must be a bit more narrow-minded than the other scholars here, but uh, I would say in order to, in order for, uh, in order to make AI ed as popular as other successful, other more successful machine learning domains like computer vision or natural language processing, where uh, recent modern technologies has provided more than 20%, 30% advantage over classical methods. And there are a lot of other technical bottlenecks at the same time. For example, uh, the difficulty to obtain data as we discussed previously, I think that's one of the most critical bottlenecks. And, and there would be other political issues as well, as uh, you mentioned. And yeah. yeah, but we are trying our best to yeah. make as soon as possible. Zach? Uh, yeah, um, I mean, that timeline to kind of perfect intelligent tutoring or adaptive tutoring style systems sounds plausible uh, to me. I also highly agree with Ryan saying um, we're on a continuum and uh, I don't think there's a kind of singularity event that happens and all of a sudden we've revolutionized education. But I do see now more than I've seen, let's say five years ago, that we are approaching um, technologies that will kind of op that will serve learners better, make their um, kind of learning more portable, right? Leverage different resources. I do think that's coming sooner in the three to five year range. But I, I, I want to raise something which, which I think is past the ten year mark, which is let, let's say we are able to create you know enough really good intelligent tutoring systems for for the K-12 topics that we have conventionally taught, you know, every 10 years, there's some big innovation or there's always some big innovation coming, whether it's the internet or data science, right? Data science wasn't taught 10, 20 years ago. There's always gonna be new material that needs to be taught. And all of these adaptive systems so far are really more about curriculum. They're about sequencing existing content and who created that content, 
it wasn't the AI, right? It was people. Mm-hmm. So there is a bottleneck of sorts, if you want to call it that, or, or this reality that we still need to create the, the actual content right. that, that students learn from. And that's really expensive. And, you know, procedurally generating like good pedagogical content, I, th- I think that's far past the five to 10 year mark. Yeah. Um, okay. And, and uh, Phil, and then Julian, and then we'll wrap up. Sure. Um, I kind of thought what Ryan suggested was a good figure. Uh, what was it? A third, say. Uh, and uh, however, I, I think I, I look at the perspective as a little bit longer term. I, uh, you know, because I, I see that real research has been done in this area since the 60s. Uh, and so that means that we've been doing it for 60 years. Uh, and we're a third of the way there. Uh, and so I, I'm going to say another 100 years. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're going to see remarkable innovations over the next 100 years. Uh, but we won't really be able to, you know, sign our, our, our children up uh, for a computerized uh, uh, tutoring system 100% uh, for, for 100 years. I mean, I do think that the model of, you know, uh, humans working together with the tutoring systems uh, is very effective and it's, but I also think it's going to be what we're doing for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. And Julian, you get the final word. Um, I, I think like, like Ryan was saying earlier, we're maybe one third of the way, I think maybe where I disagree is sort of in the timeline with Phil, I think in five or 10 years, we will make huge strides, um, Just a few months ago, we published a paper in AI at AI and Education Conference showing almost double learning gains for students using an adaptive system versus a traditional online MOOC. So I think we've come far already and in the next few years, we will make huge progress. I think Zach mentioned the problem of generating content. Last month, we just published a paper, a transformer model that can generate millions of question answer pairs uh, in hours and generate very high quality. Uh, whether they will actually help students learn or not is another question, but there is you know, the technology to generate content, to generate exercises, projects, e- even literature. You have you know, models that are being used for, to generate fake news, the same type of models we are using at Corbett to generate you know, examples, definitions, explanations. I think the technology is just around the corner um, and we will see huge strides in the next few years. Well, great. Uh, I have to tell you, it's it's perhaps uh, the most exciting area of of machine learning uh, today for me. And uh, I'm I'm sure in a hundred years uh, education will be solved, uh, but I'm hoping that the five to ten year mark uh, sees enough improvement that uh, that I'm I'm still around to participate. Uh, I really appreciate all of your time. I, I really enjoyed uh, listening to all of you. I hope I'll, I'll be in touch uh, in, in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. Yeah. Thank you, Craig.